Um, so, um, like we sort of, we just finished introductions and just to reiterate, um, so one of the things uh, that I'm assuming is you've at least gone through the uh, current software carpentry Git material uh, and roughly know your way around it at least. So uh, you know how to make a commit and push and pull from GitHub. Uh, that is essentially where we're starting at. Um, and so to start this workshop, we are going to need a repository. So I'm also going to assume that because you've gone through the Git, um, the software carpentry Git workshop, um, you have a GitHub uh, username. And so we will create a brand new Git repository um, on GitHub first. And so uh, if you've, uh, right, so when you log into GitHub, you'll see this green uh, new button, or sometimes you end up on the main, like your own GitHub repository page, in which case you can click on repositories and create a new repository from this green button. And you'll end up on a Git page that looks like this. And I'm also going to try to throw in like, uh, if you're trying to start your own project on your own, uh, hints and tricks or things that will make you hate life a little less. Um, if you do think, if you know that your, your code is going to end up on any Git hosting service like GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab in the future, the easiest way that I found is to create the empty repository on GitHub first and then bring it back down to your computer. Uh, that saves a lot of um, you creating a repository on your computer, you create a repository on Git, you accidentally click off all of these buttons, and then now things are out of sync and you're gonna have to start one side over from scratch. So what we're going to do today is we'll give it a repository name. So I usually, for my teaching workshops, I always put in the date. Um, uh, CC at home. And since the very end, I'm hoping for us to do like to do a mock collaboration or if people want to try and do that, uh, put your name at the end uh, just because, um, yes, and this will be like essentially like a live coding session. So you almost will need to like do it along with me um, or just watch uh, that works as well. Um, but if you do want to participate at the very end, you're going to need some repository uh, that you can practice with. So uh, we will be trying to pair people up. I've never done this in an online setting before, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, just so we all don't end up with the same repository name, put your name at the end. We can put a uh, description. So this is really just for metadata for your GitHub repository. Um, Carpentries at home, one point. And we'll just say initialize with the readme. We can add a license. I think GitHub now has these Creative Commons license, well, just one of the Creative Commons licenses in there. Um, and just for, we're not going to be writing any code, but just so you see it, um, you do have the option to pre-populate your repository with an ignore file for the language that you'll be working with, which ends up being pretty useful. When we're done, we'll hit create repository. And usually you would have gotten um, a completely blank screen and then some text about like, um, copy this line if you want to start from scratch or copy these two lines if you already have an existing repository. But because we pre-populated this repository on GitHub, we don't have that page anymore. So in order to get this back to our computer and this is sort of, I don't think this part gets covered in the software carpentry Git side because we create it on our computer first. So in order to get this on our computer, there is after GitHub's new layout changes, there is this, there's, it's still a green button and then you get a URL here that you can copy. Um, there is a difference between HTTPS and SSH and that only the difference there is whether or not you set up an SSH key or not. Um, and if we have time at the end and if people want to set up SSH keys, um, they can. So if you don't know what an SSH key is, I would suggest click HTTPS and use that one. 
And if you do have an SSH key set up, use the SSH key URL. And when we're done, uh, when we have that on our clipboard, we can, uh, if I can find my terminal, there it is. We can open up our git bash terminal. Um, so this is what it would look like if you installed git through the uh, Windows instructions for the software carpentry. And if you're on a Mac, it should be the regular terminal application mm -hmm. under applications utilities terminal. And if you're on a Linux machine, it is should just be in your terminal already. One of the things I really like to suggest for people to do is in their home directory, always create a folder called git. And that way, you know, uh, two things. One, this is always a place that's safe to clone in or create a new git repository, etc. So you always have a, a nice clean slate or, or a place that's clean. Um, from the software carpentry material, we create a repository using git init. And the thing you need to keep in mind in your head is like wherever you type the git init, nowhere down that entire, if you create new folders, like nowhere down that tree, uh, should you type git init again? Like you don't want nested git repositories. Um, that is something that would probably be like the workshop after this workshop. Um, and same goes with cloning. You don't want to clone a repository into another one. Um, and so if you have a git folder, as long as you're in this folder, you can always type git clone and stuff like that. Um, also, it puts all of your git repositories on your computer in one location, which is good because now you only need to look in one place. You don't have to worry about like, oh, is this thing, this folder or this project in my documents folder, is that a git repository or not? Everything's like in one location and it makes finding things or making sure things are backed up uh, much easier to do. Uh, me personally, I also break it up into like, my teaching ones are usually just dumped in the domain repo, but I also have ones where like, these are all my ones that go into Bitbucket. Uh, these are the ones that I don't, that I've just forked and stuff like that. So you can create more subfolders, but everything is still under the Git folder. And that's something that's really useful. So the first command uh, we will use is git clone. And that is the equivalent of git init. Um, in that it will create a Git repository. And in this case, we're creating it from something else. When, we're, uh, when we have that, uh, the, it will download all of the files that we have on GitHub, and then we should have something uh, to work with on our computer. If you're on a Windows computer, you can open whatever folder you have by typing explorer space period, and it'll open up like the little window in your current folder. On a Mac, I believe it's open space period, and it'll just open the folder. And on a Linux machine, it is xdg dash open space period, and that will open uh, your like whatever window you use to open things with. So we have this um, a folder with the pre-populated stuff. So we have the ignore file, the license file, and the readme file. So we will go into this folder. So 2020.07. And yeah, it's super useful. And the other, uh, the other really useful thing, it, it's not, um, this is the git terminal, the git bash terminal. If you use the regular Windows terminal, um, you can actually uh, drag like folders in here and it will open them. Uh, the only thing with Windows is Windows uses like different uh, file markers than Bash is used to um, in the Git Bash. So that doesn't work. But if you're on a Mac computer, like if you have a bunch of folders, uh, it's, it's one word. It's xdg dash open all in one word. xdg open that. Um, yeah, so that's super useful if you have like this crazy folder that it's just a pain to CD into. You can always CD and then drag the folder and it'll pre-populate for you too. Um, so what I like to do when I teach Git is I use the readme file to take notes. So the whole repository is self-documenting. Um, so, uh, so we always have um, our reference guide as we're, as we're moving along class. 
So just as a uh, refresher for the basic Git commands, uh, we will use Nano or whatever text editor you want to use or have available. Uh, you can use the terminal-based one. Um, you can, because we opened this folder, you can literally double click, uh, right click and open it in whatever uh, text editor you would like. So I'm going to be using Nano. So when I will say nano space readme.md and we will get the nano text editor. Um, this is essentially in, whoops. Uh -oh. Yes, I'm not very good at nano because I, all I do is like edit like really quick lines. Um, so this is the nano text editor. It is what I like to call blinking cursor mode in your computer. So clicking things don't really work. So everything has to be done with arrow keys and keyboard shortcuts. So the first command uh, we, we will, or, or the first thing we'll add to this readme is um, I will write in markdown format and I will essentially say git clone URL. This will download the repository from the web to your computer. And make sure you are not in another repo, um, just like git init, um, do only one per, do only one per. Okay. So uh, just like I said, um, make sure you don't have nested git repositories. And if you need a multiple git repositories to have like a very specific structure, the easiest way right now is either have like a higher level like bash script that clones them all into like the proper folder structure. Um, if you want to read more about like how you can create one repository that automatically links to others, it's called using git submodules. Um, and it's essentially any git command, you have to do it twice. You have to do it for the inner one and you have to change the outer one um, because the inner one changed. But that's how you properly NIST git repositories. So when we have some kind of text written down, uh, we can save our file. So on the bottom, it's uh, writing out is how we save in Nano. So Control O, this carrot is Control O, it is Control. So we can say Control O, sorry, Control O, enter to save, and then to exit is Control X. Okay, so the next commands uh, from uh, the software carpentry workshop was, Anytime you finish running or doing anything, or you just need to type something on your computer, type git status. Um, and I got one question that was, is there any setup for git to use it remotely? Uh, I am kind of, uh, I'm not exactly sure what that question is. Uh, you might need to rephrase it, but are you talking, if it's about having this terminal not on your computer. Um, if you have, for example, um, like an AWS or DigitalOcean instance and you need to run your code on another server, usually you would have Git on that other server to run. Um, if it's for like this workshop, I don't really have a cloud instance like pre-built for, uh, for following along, uh, mainly because the sort of assumption is you've uh, you're familiar with the software carpentry Git stuff, which also assumes that you've installed it. So we have um, a message that says that we have this readme file that is not staked for uh, commit. And in, in this case, it's red, letting us know that this is a file that Git already knows of that has changed. And so if I open my whiteboard, let me find my pen. Um, so the way Git works, is we have a series of commits, right? And we go from C1 to C2 to C3. Um, to go from one commit to another, we can't exactly um, do it directly. So we have to go through these com commands called add and commit. And this puts everything into something called a staging area. Staging area. and some of the Git documentation will uh, we'll call this the index. So if you see index or staging area or stage, uh, that's the general workflow. And so 
uh, we will add and commit this uh, change to our computer by saying git add readme.md. And if we run git status again, you'll see that we're still, it says we're on branch master. Uh, there's nothing, uh, it's up to date with origin master. And then this is in green and under the section changes to be committed. Uh, our readme file is in the staging area. And even if you use git a lot, um, I still always write status after every command because you'll you'll come across the issue of like, hey, I write, I, I wrote, I wrote my commit message, I pushed, but nothing happened. And it's probably because like you forgot to add it or something. So having or typing status um, between everything that you do is a good way to just make sure that what's happening is what you expect. So we can write our commit message. So it's git commit uh, dash M as the shorthand. So we just write the single one liner instead of having our text editor um, open everything from scratch, um, open everything to type a multi-line commit message. We can use dash M to just write this simple um, one line git commit message. So what did we do? We uh, talked about git clone. And this is our change on our local computer. And so if we go back here, um, so everything on this left-hand side of our, of our diagram, uh, this is my poor rendition on a laptop, uh, is on our local computer. And there's this other thing called a cloud. And so in our case, our cloud is going to be GitHub. Anything that's not where you typed git init or where you clone the repository into, anything that's not that folder um, is going to be called a remote. And sort of this, I'm, I'm going a little bit fast on this side because it's kind of, this is all sort of a review and setting up for the thing that we need. And in order to talk to a remote, we need a command called push and pull and a command called So we can, that is not the eraser. How do I erase that? No. No, I don't want to clear the canvas. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll figure that out later. <laughs> and so this also means, so in our case, our remote is the GitHub server because our Git repository is mirrored on GitHub. But um, you can have, you can just have another folder on your computer be like the remote. And essentially, if you try to open the remote folder, it'll be the contents of that .git folder that people tend to tell you not to change or um, like mess around with. But that's really all a remote is. So in or, um, if you want to check um, what remotes you have, and this becomes more relevant when you become a maintainer because a bunch of people are going to be sending you changes, you can say git remote dash v to look at all the remotes that you have. So um, the nice thing about setting something up on GitHub and bring it down to your computer is the remote location is already um, pre-populated for you. So origins um, pre-done for you. Um, the git init is pre-done for you. And so you get two of these URLs. One is a fetch URL, one is a push URL. Um, fetching just means when you run, when you run fetch, which is, um, really pull, and we'll talk more about the differences in a little bit, um, where you get the uh, code from, and then you have a different location where you can push code to. So this also means that you can push code into multiple locations um, if uh, you need something deployed, but use GitHub as a way to um, version control and keep track of your work. So the syntax for pushing and pulling, so push, Pull. The syntax is where and what. Hey, how's it going? Okay. And so when we rank its status, it's that first line said like, uh, we're on branch master. So this initial series of commits is going to be given a default name called master. Just like when we cloned our repo, the uh, name of that location is called by convention called origin. 
And that's just so we don't have to type in that URL over and over again every single time. And so the where is going to be what, like where the remote origin is. So it's either that full URL or this shorthand name origin. And then the what is always going to refer to the branch. So we are going to push our code to origin and we are going to be pushing our master branch. So we can say git push origin master. And I'll take the changes from our local computer, send it to uh, GitHub. And if we navigate to GitHub and refresh the page, uh, we get that first change that we have. OK, so that is the, I guess, like 20-ish minute of like all of the four hours of the software carpentry Git uh, workshop. And so the next thing um, that we're going to be working on, uh, which I haven't really found any good place that's like written is since the end goal is for us to collaborate uh, with other people and we don't want people just changing things without us knowing um, is we have to work in branches. So we're going to use the same process and I'm going to start introducing branches. Um, and the rest of the workshop is essentially working with branches is another way of um, Def defining uh, this, this current workshop. So, um, I guess that is a, oh, uh, so someone has a, there is a wave. Is that a, that's a clap. Uh, so that, I'm assuming that's a hand. So uh, Sarah, you had a question. So the way I like to teach branching and this whole notion of like a pull request is essentially I, I realized that if we just teach it with you working by yourself, so collaborate with yourself, and then the mechanisms with collaborating with other people uh, are exactly the same. So that is how I've uh, ordered that type of material. And so the way branching works is we have our series of commits um, called master. And if we wanted to do work, oh, branching versus forking. Um, at our server, we have about half we like to fork, half we like to branch. Um, OK, so the forking model is essentially the big massive collaboration model that software carpentry has and that all revolves around who can work on this repository so just like in software carpentry we have all of our lesson materials in the carpentry lesson uh, like the, the carpentry's github organization and we give very specific people the lesson maintainers access to that lesson so there is, uh, like I was a R inflammation lesson maintainer. So I was given a very special like status for that one project. And what that means is for anyone else who isn't like the core maintainer. So even if you're another person in the carpentries, this is not your like main, this isn't your project. And so I need a way to protect this project from random things coming in and anything that does come in, someone that has the maintainer status um, has to review it before it become before it gets accepted. And so that is what forking does. Forking allows you as some random person to work on a project and then submit changes versus working on the project directly. Um, and we'll talk more about forking towards the end when branches become more clear, but that's essentially why um, this workshop is also a little different from like another, this workflow is going to be different from workflows that like when I sort of run these workshops for like smaller teams at like companies or other labs in university, um, they probably just have the model of just adding people directly to the project. They're, they're not blocking um, everyone. They're not preventing anyone from contributing directly. But when you have like 300 contributors, uh, you need a core set of people looking over everything. And so there's a forking model of collaboration. 
Um, for branching, um, that's what we'll go over next. Um, branching allows us to do work, um, but still be able to jump back to uh, the thing that worked. So you can imagine like, okay, if I'm thinking about putting in a new chapter or new, um, I forgot, I don't remember what Carpentry is called their like sections, but like chapter um, to the R information material, for example, I might create a branch so that I can write the material and build the, the page and the, the lesson without messing up the, without worrying that I messed up the um, original uh, thing. So essentially it'll let me uh, go back to a previous state um, a little bit easier. Oh, right, they're called episodes. Okay, so a little bit more about uh, why branches. Um, so we have our initial set of uh, commits called master. That's something that we're used to. And what you can do is create another set of commits. And this red here can be, um, I'll call it branch one for now, um, a branch. And you'll see people usually draw out branches with a little kink in there. But if you look at this graph, it's really still linear. So you can also imagine um, this graph being drawn out like this. And that's important because when you look at the graph in the terminal, it will appear linear like this. Um, and sometimes there will be a kink, but if it's only one branch, it'll look linear. So these two representations are going to be the same. And what this means is master branch is still this black dot, right? So master is still pointing to uh, right here. So this is master, right? So I should not uh, write it back there. So what branching lets you do is you can create a bunch of commits for that branch. And if for whatever reason, your boss is like, hey, I need you to rerun that report from yesterday you can always jump back to the thing that worked, rerun something, and then jump back to the current thing that you're working on. And this works for software where you're trying to implement like a new like function or something and you just don't know if it works yet. Maybe like you have all of these trials um, that you're just you know writing commits for and you don't know if it's gonna work. Um, like I am working on a project with another student. Uh, she's working on a dashboard. I'm working on a natural language processing thing, uh, we don't really, our commits don't really touch the same file. So I would like to work in peace and she would like to work in peace and then we'll work on combining things later on. So that's the other benefit of a branch is if you plan the project out good or well enough uh, where you don't have collisions of work where, and I define collision of work of like the same person editing the same file, um, then branches let you essentially just work on your own and essentially treat that GitHub repository as like your own personal one. Um, and then you worry about merging things in later on. So the first thing we're going to do is how do we create branches and how do we add commits to a branch? So we will go back to our um, terminal window. And so So I am currently running Git version 2.27.0. Um, I believe it's Git 2.24, 25, whatever version that came out last August. Um, there's Git created two more functions because the original one was too confusing. So there's a, but there's a few ways and your prompt may look different depending on which version of Git you have. The way we can create a branch is saying git branch. And then we can say a branch name. So we can say something like my first branch. And all that's going to do is wherever we currently are, it's going to create a branch. How do we see um, what the branches are and how do we see the where are we? We can see, we can type git branch dash a and it will um, update, oh, no, sorry, not update. 
uh, show you all of the branches that you have. Uh, one of the questions was, should you update Git? You don't have to update Git. Like all of the features are the same. It's literally like some of the prompts that are showing up on the newer versions are going to be a little bit different. Um, and there's, as a Carpentries maintainer, there is some conversation for like how to handle this update in the Git repo. Um, and so uh, the Git lesson, um, but you don't really have to update it um, now or ever really. Um, just know that the prompts might be different. And so, um, and usually if you type Git status, it'll tell you like what you need to type anyway. So like there are a lot of Git commands that I don't exactly remember like how they work. I just know if I type Git status, I see how to use it. So you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to update your Git system. So we can say git branch dash a to Thanks. list out all, yeah, mm -hmm. um, to list out all of the uh, branches that we have. The one in green, or if it's if you don't have color coding um, set up for git, the one with the star next to it is the one that you are currently in. So when we type git status, that first line that says on branch master, that is the one that's green or the one with the star next to it. Because we have a remote, um, there's also references to where the remote is. And so you'll have all of the branches on the remote as well. So you can imagine if you're collaborating with a bunch of people, like you'll have work for your own stuff. People are gonna have work for theirs. They might be sending work to that central GitHub repository or I'm using GitHub um, in this example. Um, but it's just a reference saying that like, hey, there's something there. You don't have to do anything to it. Um, the only time that matters is if you as a maintainer need, needs to fix something in that branch. So that's pretty common in the software carpentry world, especially in the R lesson, uh, because the R lessons build off of an R markdown document, not a markdown document. Uh, and sometimes when you get um, contributions, people will change the markdown document, not the R markdown document. And so, uh, you might have to go in and change uh, their work on that side. Um, so the entire session is going to be around like three and a half hours. Um, I'm going to go over this section, uh, finish this section up, and then we'll take like a 10 minute break. So uh, this, this particular session, section will be like another five more minutes or so. And then the entire workshop is like three and a half hours. So we use git branch to create a branch. How do we like go on the thing, go onto that branch? So we want to go to that uh, branch that we just created. Um, or one step back, um, how do we see like that whole tree of like um, our history? So one command I will like type this into uh, the etherpad and in chat. Um, this is a command that you're probably going to end up typing a bunch. Um, and I'll type it at the bottom. Okay. So git log dash dash one line. That's something we've seen um, from the first GitHub, uh, the software carpentry git lesson. The graph essentially just give, makes it a little pretty and gives us like a nice graph form. The decorate and all, I, for, I, compl I a sort of forgot what decorate does, but the all sort of shows you the entire tree. I believe decorate gives you like these other branch names and colors. Um, but this is how you see like this head, this arrow is pointing to master. That's exactly what's shown here. Like the thing that has a star next to it. Or when you run status, you're on branch master because head is pointing to master. It also shows us like, hey, the version on GitHub is also here. Uh, the version of GitHub is also pointing to here. And then we also, because we created a branch, that branch location is also here. And so that's how you read this log information. And that's why when I drew out the graph here, I drew, I showed you like this linear graph, because even though that there's another branch here, um, it's still shown uh, in a linear fashion. So. Um, eventually your eyes will get used to like, oh, this is a new uh, like branch and et cetera. So now the question is how do we move head to, uh, from master to our 
uh, branch we just created. There's two ways. Uh, now there's two ways. The original way, and if you're on an older version of Git, it would be using Git checkout and then my first branch. And you'll get the message, switch to branch this. Um, and this will always work. Um, so the updates to Git are also backwards compatible. So if you use the older version, uh, the, older, the older commands, uh, that's totally fine. Uh, the newer command is git switch, and then the, I'll, I'll switch back to master. So the command is now switch. Uh, so you can see like checkout is like less intuitive. And so they broke out check, they turned the checkout function into switch and restore because checkout did a bunch of things. So you can choose to use switch, you can choose to use checkout. Both will do the same thing. Just to show you, we can say git switch my first branch. If you have the, if you're on Windows and there's a link in the notes on how if to get like the branch showing on a Mac and um, on Linux, uh, this is why people end up changing their prompts. If you work in branches, to always show you the branch. You don't want to accidentally work on master, and I'll send you a link on like how you could fix that. Um, but that's why people always see like what branch that they're working on. So I'm on my uh, branch that I just created. And we can pretend this is like the master branch that we were on, the only, um, in terms of adding and committing. So I can open up this uh, file, and we can write a new section. So I can say branches. What did we just learn? We saw git branch and then branch name, create a new branch you are and then we can say git switch sWh branch name moves moves to branch and then git checkout branch name is the older way Okay, so that's some text I'm at, uh, I've made to this readme file. And just like before, I can say git status. And really in your head, the only thing that should be different is that first line. Instead of on branch master, it is now the branch. Everything else is exactly the same. So it's saying that, hey, you have this file. It's different. Uh, please do something about it. Or just, hey, this file has changed. Um, and just a little more review, we can say git diff of our readme, and we can get the differences uh, for that file, right? So all of the uh, core material from software carpentry, that applies, that still applies. The only difference is you're on a different branch. And if you replace like that new branch name with master, every all of the mechanics are going to be the same. And so we have a change to this file. We can say like, hey, this is a change that I like. And just like before, we can add this change. So we can add this readme and we can commit this readme and say uh, a commit on a branch. Cool. Decorate dash dash all. And so now if we look at the git log um, information, and there's also a way to um, like alias this, like I think I've, I've aliased it to like LL, so I don't have to type that whole thing anymore. Uh, but, uh, and I'll paste that in like during the break, how you can set that up. Um, so the big long set of um, the log, you can imagine, um, is a little bit different now. Our head is pointing to our first branch, and this is our new commit. So that's part of the branch is that new commit. And then you can see master is below us, so we've sort of de started to deviate from um, the master branch. Um, if you are getting an error on switch. Uh, so the is, error I'm getting, and this might be the you may have already covered this, so apologies for my lack of being 
uh, totally attentive. Um, I'm typing git switch and I'm getting a git response back that says git switch is not a git sub command. See oh. git help. Yeah. So if you get like that kind of error message, it's saying that like your version of git is not up to date to like the, the one past last, last August. Okay. So, I might want to. So instead update. of switch, so instead of switch, you will say check out. And oh, then that will... oh, okay. That was the thing you were covering. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Get yeah. get checkout space and then my and then the first branch. Yep. Branch. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And then the, and the, it told me it switched. Now I think to it, it you yes. told me I couldn't switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Just teasing. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of like, it's super annoying when like things update and it's just like, now what do we do with the lesson plan? Because like, we still have to teach the old stuff because people, not everyone's going to update. Um, yeah, but that could be a good place to start is to like update, you know, at the very beginning of, of any like workshop, like let's check what version we're on. Yeah. I don't know. Then yeah. That's going off on a tangent, but. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for yeah. helping with that. I appreciate yeah. it. No problem. Um, all right, so next is, okay, how do we get this thing like merged in, right? So this is now like, how do I collaborate with myself? Um, there is a git merge command. I, I, to be honest, like I haven't used it in so long because I essentially send myself pull requests. Like I am my own contributor and maintainer. And I sort of like that system because it sort of tracks all of that stuff on GitHub. And so like I can take notes about what worked, what didn't work. I can reference things. I can send my advisor like a URL, like this is what I did. Um, so let's go through that uh, process. And if you have to uh, run, cause it's like the first hour is essentially up. Um, yeah, um, it's all recorded. So uh, don't worry if you have to leave. Um, so how do we now get this branch up to GitHub? So if we go back to our diagram and I like drawing these diagrams also for like all of my students as well. Um, it helps because if you ever get stuck with a Git problem, if you can draw out the problem, um, chances are you can figure out what command you need to run to fix it. Um, and so just to annotate this diagram a little bit more, um, head is the thing that where you're looking, right? So how do we get that branch up to GitHub? Um, so everything is on our local computer. So the words pushing and pull only apply if you're crossing this barrier into a remote. So if, you, if it's a problem that's on your computer and not a problem on GitHub, the words push and pull should not like, you don't have to think about them. Um, and so it, it helps compartmentalize like your problem. So we now want to send something to GitHub, which is our remote. So we know we want to take something from our local computer to the remote, so the command we're using is push. Um, and that's sort of like um, why certain Git things, I don't like using the GUI because when you f like freak out and you start clicking everything like that, you can potentially make things worse. Um, I've done it where I'm just like, I don't know, like let me just click everything until it fixes itself and it usually will not fix itself. So um, draw out your problem and everything will be okay. So we will run push. And so the notation for push is where and what. So where, we're still pushing to GitHub, so it's going to be origin. And the what part, which is the branch, um, instead of master is going to be that new branch that we just created, right? Um, and let me backtrack one uh, a little bit more um, before we touch on uh, uh, pushing and pulling. So we have, I can use cat to dump out the contents of the file. Um, so we just made this change, which is branches, right? These, this branch section down here. Why people use branches, if I use git checkout master or git switch master, if I go back to the master branch, you'll notice that, and I cat the file again, the files like actually changed on my computer. Like even if you like go to like your explorer window or your finder window and you open this thing, like the file has physically changed on your computer. And so this is another reason why people like branches is like, um, like for me, when I work on a shiny application in R, um, if I want to add a new widget, I will like literally make a new branch for it because the, the possibility, the chances of me forgetting a curly bracket, a comma, a round bracket or something like writing a, 
a shiny dashboard is like so high that it's just way easier for me to just like throw away my changes and start over again. Um, and so that's another reason why people work in branches is they can work in isolation. And if they mess up, they can always jump back to the, to their original starting point. And so our original starting point was master. And so you can see, I can switch back to master or get switch back to my first branch and then look at our file. And you can see like, the file version, or it's really like the entire snapshot of the project. It's not just one file. Um, all of the files would change. And so that's another reason if you're a maintainer um, and you're trying to build like your lesson, or, like make a change to one of the episodes, you might do it or you will have to do it as a branch just in case that thing doesn't build properly. You can always go back to the thing that worked. Right, like um, you don't want to like push something and all of a sudden like it's broken, the site doesn't load and then you have no way of going back. So branches are a, another way you can think of a branch is it is a label for a series of commits, right? So if we go back to our diagram, master refers to all of these commits in black and then branch one refers to all of the ones in red, including the ones in black. So. A branch name is really a label for a series of commits. And so you can think of it as like, you know, you can name your branch like final one, final two, final, final, right? Like that, that, that uh, picture that we know. Um, and so that's really all it's doing. All right, just to finish this off, we can say git push origin my first branch. So instead of origin master, um, This text will roughly look the same as before. The only difference is going to say new branch because instead of master to master, uh, we created our new branch. And so that means on GitHub, if we refresh our page, if you've never submitted a pull request before, this is how you submit a pull request. Submitting a pull request or creating a pull request is pushing a branch to GitHub. And you'll see this little button on the top. And a pull request is essentially how you will merge in a branch. Um, and so I, so the task that we're doing now, whoops, is how do we take this information and combine it with, um, our, our branch, right? And so we do this with a merge or, a or a pull request. So pull request is something specific to GitHub in GitLab and Bitbucket, they're called merge, merge requests. Um, and so that's another way of like compartmentalizing your work is like pull request is only on the web interface when you're trying to do a merge. So to, to create it, we get this new button, we can click create pull request and it'll pre-populate with our message. And this page is for yourself. Um, this is, um, I like the pull request system when I'm working, even if it's a one person show, um, one person project, because at the bottom, I get to preview my own work, right? So I get a nice web interface of the differences between the files. Uh, so I can double check to make sure I didn't put in a massive data set in here. Uh, my code kind of looks okay. I like roughly didn't make a typo, although this won't really tell me that. And we can also leave a comment. So we can say like um, creating and merging uh, PR, right? You can leave this blank if you're working with yourself. If you're working on larger teams, there's usually like, please explain what you did so I don't have to read every code line by line. When we clicked that green button, now this becomes a pull request. So up here on the pull request tab, it'll increment by one. And so we can now click this and you can see that request is now on this page. Right, so if you're a maintainer, this is where all the changes people um, are suggesting into that lesson uh, will show up, is on this pull request tab. And you can click this. You have a couple options, um, a couple tabs. You can see all of the commits that happened. Um, usually this isn't going to be something you'll check unless people are really careful of how they create their commits. You can literally see how one version is changing to another. But as a maintainer, or as yourself, you will go to the files change tab. And this is how you do the review. So if you've ever heard of like a code review or just a review, um, this is where you do it. Um, you'll notice that 
as you hover over lines, you you'll, there's this plus um, thing. And GitHub allows you to select multiple lines. So you can say like, this looks great. Right, so you can start a review, add a single comment. So this is where the review process happens. So as a maintainer, it's not really your job to fix pull requests, although sometimes that you just end up doing that um, to just get the change incorporated. Um, as someone submitting something, this is how the maintainer will tell you like what you need to fix or what, what needs to change before they accept it. Um, back on the conversation tab, so this is the main one that you see. Um, you can assign reviewers, et cetera. Um, and as a maintainer, you'll get this, um, this tab about like, what is your review? And you can uh, formally create that review. And all of this stuff that you've done in Files Change will show up in the conversation tab. Um, and you can have your conversation there. The important thing as a maintainer uh, is you get this nice green button uh, for a, and that's because I, this is my project and this is where the forking model comes into play. Um, because if you still want to change, uh, only the main person, the main maintainer is allowed to click or have this green button. Uh, it might be grayed out if it's not your project uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So in order to do that merge, so if we go into our diagram, in order to have all of these changes back into our master branch, uh, we can hit merge, merge the merge request, confirm our merge, and then we'll successfully merge and merged our uh, branch. What I like to do is also delete this thing. Um, if it's like completely done, delete it on the spot. Uh, Uh, yeah, and I will do the uh, <laughs> I will do the break right after this one last bit, uh, just to round it off. So on our GitHub page, on our master branch, you'll see that everything is great. Everything's up to date here. Um, and I think we'll we'll take our break from there. So um, when we come back, uh, the thing that we'll work on is, hey. We, now our GitHub remote is going to be out of sync from our local computer, right? Um, because our master branch is are different. And so we'll work on, I'll show you how you can sync all of that stuff up in about 10 minutes. So I will, uh, open up our YouTube timer and we'll take a 10 minute break. This example, create a new branch, edit the readme. Um, so we'll go through that uh, exercise one more time. Um, and so we can do more things with branches. Um, I showed you how to create a new branch by saying git branch and then branch name. There is a, there's a faster way of doing this uh, because chances are if you're trying to make a branch, you want to go to the branch. So you can make and go to the branch at the same time. The command, the older command for that is git checkout dash b, so for branch. Um, and then we can say, we can call this, um, what should we call this? Um, instead of like my second branch, I have no idea what's a good name for this. <laughs> We're talking about creating branches, right? So we can, I made a new branch called creating branches because that's what I'm going to talk about in the readme file. Um, some people also, if you're working with like very large groups, they will put like their initial and then their branch name. So people in your group also know like who's working on what or like, et cetera. So you don't want like 50 branches and like, I have no idea who's working on what. Um, so there are like some conventions, conventions that people use, but that's really up to the group that you're with. You'll notice that when I say dash B, it will switch to the new branch automatically. Depending on your prompt, it will change. And if you type git status, it will definitely show the other branch. Um, so that will save you one step from saying git branch and then check out again. The git switch way is git switch dash C. I, I have no idea why they decided to also change the flags. That's like even more confusing. Um, C for create. So it's switching to a branch, but you're creating it. 
Um, so that's the get switch way of doing it. Um, but for everyone else, the, the way that will definitely work, regardless of what version, is git checkout dash b. And then if you're following the newer git functions, um, switch. Switch dash c. So we have a new branch. Let us edit our readme file. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, I talked about uh, git fetch dash dash uh, prune will update your local tr uh, git tree with the remote. The prune will also delete references to branches that were deleted on the remote. The other thing that we just did before was get uh, branch dash D and then branch name. This will delete branch name on your local computer. So the deleting is only on your local computer. Like just because you deleted a branch on your local computer, it doesn't automatically delete the branch on GitHub. Um, you essentially have to push the deleted branch to GitHub if you want to delete it on GitHub. Um, I just find it easier to go to GitHub and delete the branch with a button because I, I don't remember how to do that right now uh, in terms of like pushing a deleted branch. Um, oh, and then two other things, um, since we just talked about it, um, shortcuts for, shortcut is one word, cuts for creating branches. So git branch, sorry, git checkout dash b branch name, git switch dash c. Create and move. Okay. So uh, that's roughly what we just covered. Those are the changes I've made. I'm going to look at git status. Okay. Um, one very common thing um, that will be um, that you probably seen if you worked with branches before is let's say like you're working on something um, and then you maybe you did some commits maybe you like forgot a file or something maybe this is a you committed like three files but you forgot one of them um, however um, whatever you did in such such a way where when you run git status you still have some uh, red files if you were to now say like your boss chimes in and is like hey I need you to run that report again um, and then you say, okay, I got you. And you say, get checkout master. Um, oh wait, that didn't do what I wanted. Hmm. Uh, huh. Wait, hold on. <laughs> okay, never mind. Uh, that didn't do what I wanted. Uh, that is weird. Okay, never mind. Forget that. Um, I was trying to. There will be a time um, so when you try to move between branches, and I, I guess, I don't know why this. Maybe it might have been a newer Git version, but if you sometimes when you try to check out to a different uh, Git branch, Git will block you, um, and say like, I can't check out to another branch because you have uh, changes that have not been committed. Either commit your changes or stash them. Uh, the, the trick was like, if you ever see the prompt about stashing, um, where does stashing come into all of this? Uh, and sometimes when you're moving around Git branches a lot, um, and this might be the case when you're working, when you're maintaining work and you're trying to figure out why something's not rendering properly on this branch that you're in versus the original master branch. Um, how to use Git stash like the very quick way is you say Git stash, And essentially what git stash is doing is doing a very temporary commit. Um, so 
the, the way the, the other way around git stash if you never want to use it or you know one less command to remember is before you switch to a branch commit your branch uh, commit your current state and it could be something as silly as like i have no idea what's going on here but i need to move right that that's that's totally fine i guess um, and then um, git would let you pass that that block um, so that that was the thing that i was trying to mimic before um, you can do your thing and then go back to your branch from before how do you get that stuff back is if you look at stash get stash list it will you'll see that like here it is your very temporary uh commit for the things that you were working on and so if you want to have all of those things reapplied back you say get stash apply and it will dump those changes back. Um, so it never actually made the commit because maybe you're not ready for like a proper commit and certain workflows, like people treat commits like, you no, know, they should only be like completed things, like things that are not like actually working, don't commit them. Um, that's how you will use stash. And that's like the very qu quick and dirty way of like, Git is preventing me to move somewhere. Uh, I don't want to write a commit. I can use stash instead. Um, and if you don't want to use stash, the workaround is write the commit message and then move. So, and yes, it may not have com um, conflicted. That might be the reason why it didn't actually prompt you or prompt me. Uh, we'll go over conflicts like in the very next example, but that's where stashing, uh, if you ever see that message, that's where stashing will come in. Um, and if it only happens during conflicts, maybe I'll just do it again for the conflict side. Um, okay, so we can we have our um, file that we have changed. So we can say git add readme.md. We can look at git status. Um, if you ever need to diff something in the staging area, it's dash dash staged. Because um, if you use regular git diff, it will show you nothing, and that's another. Um, that's another thing pointing to the existing software carpentry material. So this is the notes for branching and fetching and pruning. So we can say, talk about creating branches, creating, deleting, pruning branches. Okay, so we have our change, we can push our branch, so git push origin. Remember, it's not master because that is just muscle memory for me and everyone really. Um, and this is also another reason why I sort of um, don't rely too much on GUIs uh, because it's it's too easy to like click buttons and the drop downs might you might look over drop downs and stuff. So this sort of just slows me down. Um, and this will take our new branch, send it to GitHub. If we go to our GitHub page, at the top, uh, GitHub has gotten better in that new branch pushes will always create this new pop-up. If you don't see this pop-up, you can, and the way GitHub like reconfigured like all of their, their page, uh, next to the branch dropdown, there is a branches uh, tab and you can go to your, you can see the branches that we have and you can click this new pull request button here. And so if that drop down of like creating new pull request doesn't show up, um, you can still do it uh, through manually yourself. Um, I'm not gonna go over, I'm not gonna leave a comment here um, and we can go down and again, review your own work before uh, submitting it to someone else to review. And this is the page that shows up as an actual pull request. One thing about pull requests, so if we go back to our um, file here and someone had said in our thing, you talk about stash, sorry, stash, but 
it's not in here. So they can make a comment. Um, I can finish my review as a as an actual review that needs to be like dealt with. Um, the thing about a pull request is you don't need to recreate the pull request if you are making a change to the same like branch. So um, a lot of people will like create a new branch where they are, make the thing and then resubmit a new pull request. Um, no, once you push that branch up, you can keep working on that branch. This pull request will automatically update. So you don't have to start over from the very, oops, sorry, start over from the very beginning every single time. Um, so if you do get, hold on, let me see, get push, does this work? Yeah. Um, if you um, create the new, if you create an empty Git repository, like without any of the flags, you will see that one of those commands is git push dash u origin master. Uh, don't type this. Um, this dash u sets up the default. And this dash u stands for this flag, which is set upstream. Um, and so that's why sometimes a lot of people would just say git push, git pull, and GitHub or git, not really GitHub, automatically assumes origin and master. Um, you do have to use this dash u if you're working in RStudio and like our studio has its drop down menus when you create a new project, it has the ability to create one already pre done with Git, in which case it would set this up for you. But if you do end up in our studio and it's very clearly a Git project, but your Git tab doesn't work, um, it's because you have to tell our studio what the default is. Um, and that's another reason why I don't like the buttons is because that button will default to master. Um, And I would say there is no difference if you're working on master to set up the default because that's what it's for as it's set up to be convenient as a convenient, like something convenient for you to do less typing. Um, I've just over the years gotten into the habit of not relying on the default. Uh, one, because I have to teach this stuff and magical things are not always good when you're teaching. Um, and it also, again, forces me to slow down. And if I just say push, you can see like, because I never set it up, um, it will error at me. And, it'll, and again, it will stop me and make me, and it'll force me to think like, what am I actually doing? I am not trying to push to master. I'm trying to push to this branch. So it sort of slows you down in that sense. Um, but if you're really just working on master, it's really um, a, like a, if you're not working with branches and it's just master, yes, just use git push, git pull. Um, without the origin master bit. Right, okay. Um, so we had this comment about, we talked about stash, but it's not in there. And like pull requests are, um, you, they automatically update. So what does that look like if we go to readme and we talk about branches. Uh, I'll stick this in uh, branches for now. Git, git stash, um, saves your work, save. It's not really like save, uh, saves your work. I don't know how to spell temporary, so I will just <laughs> uh, make it temp. And then git stash list to show your stashes. And git stash apply to apply your last stash. So this does a, what is it, first in, last out kind of thing. I forgot what the computer science term for that. I think it's a stack, right. Um, okay, so I wrote something about stash. I can save and quit. And so when you, when someone asks or when you are asked of or someone asks you or you ask someone else to make a change, they don't have to do anything with the current uh, branch that they submitted the pull request to. 
they can just keep building on top of that same pull request. So I looked at get status. We made a change to a readme. That readme was the diff. Um, if you ever see a red line, that also is a prompt uh, to say this file that I just created has an extra blank line at the bottom, or it's missing a uh, an empty line, and that's really just a uh, that's really just a thing computers like is to have a file with a blank line at the end because when you cat them, you actually get your prompt back as a new line versus like a continuation of the file. Um, that's one of the reasons why. Um, so we can look at git diff. Um, everything looks good on our end. Um, we can say, sorry, I have to add this, git add readme, git status. So it's in our staging area. You can see here, um, depending on your version of git, if you want to undo, like to unstage, it says git restore dash dash staged. Um, I never remember this command on how to unstage a file. If you're on the older version, this will now, I think this says git reset. Um, I don't remember for sure because I have never actually remembered the command. Um, I rely on git status to tell me what to do. So on the newer versions, it's definitely restore. And I believe the older versions, the older version pre like August, 2019 is git reset dash dash staged file. So that might be one of the differences you see on my computer versus yours. Um, so we can commit our file. Uh, whoops, whoops. Thank you. Empty commit messages are not allowed. Uh, talk about stash. And if we re-push to the same branch, which we already created the pull request, so we don't have to um, GitHub's not gonna prompt us with that pull request button. We're not gonna have to create a new pull request. If we refresh the pull request page, um, you'll see at the top, it's now one commit to two. Talk about creating, deleting, pruning branches, and then talk about stash. Um, so it automatically, this pull request automatically updated. And if we go back uh, to the file view, you can see like that stuff is there. And then you as a maintainer, you can or you as the person who uh, was asked to make the change can resolve this conversation. It's been resolved because I actually did what you did. And you can, as a maintainer, choose to merge this pull request. Um, one of, I, I mentioned before, there is squash and merge, rebase and merge. This is also one of those, like depending on the group that you're working with, um, this might be different. Uh, creates a merge commit, essentially, um, is what we have been doing where all of the commits are just stacked on top of master. And then you get one commit at the end that says, uh, this was a merge, a merge happened here. Squash and merge essentially is saying, take all of the commits in this pull request or in this branch, turn it into one commit message and then merge it. So all of the individual changes within the branch will be lost, but you get one commit message that says like, what did this whole branch do? Um, some people like this because it makes the master branch very clean. Like every commit in master is one task with, where each task was one branch. Um, when I was at our studio, we used rebase and merge, uh, and I'll show you rebasing in a bit, but, uh, usually you only have to do this rebasing part, uh, when you have conflicts that you have to fix. So those are, that's another thing, depending on the group that you're working with, um, you, that's just whoever is in charge of that project will set that up. Uh, but for the most part, this merge pull request, the default one is uh, pretty standard and the one I think is used by software carpentry because it's less confusing if things go wrong. So we can merge, confirm our merge, and then uh, go, going back to that checklist, this is actually like completely done. So delete it on our uh, remote. Um, come back to our local computer, um, go to master, uh, prune our branches, look at our branches so we don't uh, mistype anything, git branch dash D, creating branches, uh, oh, sorry, git pull origin. 
So you can see like I, I forgot to pull master. Um, and so it's going to say like, hey, uh, the version on your local computer doesn't have any reference of this branch being merged. Uh, that's, a, that's one of Git's way of saying like, if you delete this now, I can't guarantee that if you lose work, I can't like undo it. Um, so that's where this capital D, it's saying like, but if you really mean to like delete this, use capital D. So, uh, and that's for me is because I forgot to pull the master branch. And now I can say git branch dash D creating branches and I can delete the branch because git itself knows that that branch was merged. How does it know that branch was merged is this, this branch right here, merge pull request number two from this. That is how it's using, it, the, the reference is there on how it's, uh, uh, that that branch was merged. Um, you can see before I have some remnant of like the stash. Uh, the stash is essentially a temporary commit. Um, so we can say git stash, I think it's clear um, to get rid of your all of your stashes. So you end up with like a nice pretty tree. Um, and this is, uh, you want a nice pretty tree without a bunch of these extra flags because it does, uh, if you have extra things in there, it does create like these offshoots more, more of these offshoots, in which case it, it becomes really hard to figure out like, where did master actually start? Or like, where is this branch actually starting? Okay. All right, all right. So next problem that we can run into is we have our branches. So let's say we have our master branch and then we create a, another series of branches and somehow master branch got updated. Um, this can either be like as a maintainer, you can have multiple pull requests coming in. So just by merging one pull request, another pull request will fall, like fall behind. Uh, another branch will fall behind or another pull request will fall behind. And so if there are no conflicts between these two versions, GitHub is still going to give you that green button and you can um, click the green button and merge it. What some people like to do, um, and if for example, in the software carpentry lesson point of view, um, if you want to preview your current branch with those other changes at the same time, you now need to update your branch such that it looks like, hold on, this was a bad color to use. So let me, let me do this green, All right? So you have this scenario. You want a scenario such that it looks something like, um, your black uh, commits, your green commits, and then the actual red ones uh, that you're working on, right? And you'll notice I also rewrote it in such that like without the little kinks uh, to show that like these two representations are going to be the same. And so essentially I'm taking these three red commits, going back to the base master, going to the beginning of master and then essentially replaying those commits one at a time. And that process is known as a rebase. Um, yes, um, I, I use rebase in this sense uh, for this lesson because it's sort of easier to, uh, I find it a little easier to work with. Um, some people have workflows of like they never rebase anything, in which case that's also where you hear the term cherry picking. Um, and cherry picking can be thought of as let me go here and then I know the commit hashes for each one of these things. So I'm just going to pick, like literally pick them one at a time. So instead of this replaying back and forth, uh, you 
are picking one commit at a time. Um, there's at the for this particular case, it does the same thing. Um, people don't like rebasing because that is where um, re rebase as a command technically is changing history. That is the definition of what rebasing is doing. And people don't like changing history um, in Git repositories. So uh, that's sort of where the like two camps are going to be along that on the, along those lines. So let's mock this up. Um, we'll have a situation where we have one master is ahead of a current branch that we're on. And how do we deal with that? Um, just for time's sake, um, I'll just create this example such that there is already a conflict. Uh, but if there isn't a conflict, then it'll just go through automatically and I'll, and I'll show you what it looks like with a conflict. Okay, so we we'll, um, we can do the merging on GitHub, and I can always like do the commits straight on master. But I'll do this example such that we will create two. We'll create two separate branches, and then accept one, and then see the conflict in the other. Uh, so that's what we'll do. Um, so we're on master, and just looking at the log before. Uh, we have master, we have origin master, and we have origin head. Head is pointing to master. We don't, right now we have a pretty clean uh, slate. So we can say git checkout dash b or git switch dash c. Um, both of those commands will do the same thing. And I can say um, change title, change title one. And let's make a uh, change to the title here. Um, let's say we don't like this title uh, that we have here. And I want to call this uh, Carpentry. What is the actual uh, conference thing? Carpentry Con at home. Carpentry Con. Is it like the at, at sign? Simple. At simple. At home. 2020 uh, git. Okay. So uh, for one of these branches, I'll just change the title um, to Carpentry Con at home. Uh, save this and look at our status. Um, diff this thing to make sure like that's the only thing I actually changed. Add the readme file, commit the readme file, uh, and say uh, change title for the conference. Git push origin change title one, All right? So those mechanics are um, if you're just out of like carpentry, like Git work, um, the Git, the base Git uh, lesson, that is everything from there. The only difference is the branch change. And this is really just a, another repeat of everything we've been working on for the last like two and a half hours. The, and if we go now to GitHub, you can see it's going to prompt us for a pull request change. So we'll create this. And I will call this title, just so it's a little easier to see, uh, just give it that title. And I'm not going to merge it yet. All right, so we have one pull request. So how do we mock up this example? Let's uh, check out master. So let's go to our master branch and create a new branch. So git checkout dash b. Uh, change title two and this readme file. Uh, maybe, for example, I I like the date up here, um, and then we can say carpentry con at home. Uh, 
PR or con ad hook. Okay, so the main thing is I wrote some change to the, uh, the same line as the previous example and some other change to another file underneath and just to show the merge conflict example. So we can say git status, it's just a readme, and th those are the lines that have changed. And again, the most important thing is make sure it was like the same exact line as before. Um, add the readme file and commit the readme file. Uh, keyboard keyboard not keyboarding the keyboard is not keyboarding that's not good uh, okay there we go git commit dash m um, this is title change with date, for example. Git push origin change title to. Okay. Um, what I also like to do is show you what this looks like. Graph one line decorate all. What this looks like when you have multiple branches diverging off of master. Um, and so we can see here, our head is still pointing to change title two because that's where we are looking at. Um, and we have a reference to master below us. And if we and this is where the um, dash dash graph part comes into play where you get like these little stars and an actual printout of the graph. You see that master was here and then we have one offshoot for title change one and then another offshoot for title change two. And if each of these those branches have multiple commits, then you'll see more, like within that same indentation, more of those stars and commits. So that's how you'll read um, this graph. And if you ever like get confused, like why one branch isn't having um, stuff contained into another, you will literally like run this command and like look and see like, oh, it's because like they all diverge from master. One is not built on top of the other. So um, that's what we're going to fix now, uh, but this is how you read that graph or this graph. This becomes, and you end up looking at this graph a lot also because um, if you need to like jump to another branch, you'll, you can either refer to it as the commit hash or you can see like, oh, this is the name of the branch as well if you want to go there. All right, so now on GitHub, we should have another change. So title change two, um, and we can say title change with date. That's fine. Create the pull request. Great. So right now, as you as a maintainer, everything's going to look fine, right? Um, both of these branches, you can review them. You can see like, okay, that looks like a good title. And if you go to the other branch, that also looks like a good title. Uh, you may not be aware that there is a conflict going on. And because of the way these branches were diverging off of master, there is no conflict uh, going on. They, they are branches that exist on their own and everything is fine. So this is one of those things of like, yes, sometimes the order of the, the pull request that you accept, like it will matter in that like, you might have a whole stack that like everything is great. You get this nice pretty green button at the bottom and then you merge one, one thing and then like they all don't work anymore. Uh, so this is a very common problem. Um, and usually you can ask the submitter to um, like resubmit and rebase, but chances are if it's, uh, chances are like they won't know the, the, the rebasing mechanics to fix it. So it's sort of like on you as the maintainer to do this. So the way you fix this is let's just merge one for now. It doesn't really matter which one, but I will pick title one, because that's the first one that came in. So what I kind of like to do also is like I, you can start from top to bottom or 
oldest to newest. Um, as a maintainer, I would suggest do oldest to newest so you don't forget the people that like submitted your, uh, a change like three months ago. Uh, so we'll do the first one, the older one first, and we will hit merge pull requests, confirm merge. Great. And then we'll delete this branch. Cool. Everything's fine. We go to our pull request thing because it's closed. It'll show up in the closed section. We'll go to the next part and then GitHub's going to be like, hey, this thing isn't working. Um, GitHub has been much better with the web interface where you can resolve the conflict um, on the GitHub page. And if this is something as simple as this example where it's like just one file and it's a readme file, um, if you look at resolve conflicts, like it's exactly the same thing we'll see in Nano in a, in a bit. And you can resolve it straight on uh, the GitHub interface. And this will work great if it's something like the readme file. With a lot of the Carpentries material, it is some website that needs to be generated, in which case you might not want to do this because you can't preview the website. Um, and so I will not do it here and I'll go back. And so how do we fix this thing? Um, the way we fix it is let's go back to our um, terminal in our computer. We'll go back to our master branch. So if we go back, so if I show you the diagram, what's going on, we're now in this state right here. We had a master branch, we merged one branch, and then we have to merge this other branch with a conflict. So we essentially need to replay it such that this branch is on top of the other one. So it incorporates those changes. Fi doing that process will fix the merge conflict. And then we go back to the example that we had an hour ago, which is we can uh, merge this branch like a normal branch. So we're on master. There was a change on master. So let's get all of the um, right parts on our computer. And this is, um, and if like, because one of the question is like, when would you use fetch instead of um, straight up pull? Um, this is one of those times where you might want to do something like that. Uh, just to make sure like you have all the pieces on your computer, you want to run each piece individually before you like merge everything onto your computer. But I'm going to use git pull origin master. So now I have everything in with master that's in sync with uh, the GitHub page. So if I say git, I'm going to use the alias like the git log with a bunch of flags. Um, so you can see head origin master is this merge pull request. Um, if we follow how these things are working, it's coming from change title one. Change title one came from uh, this other bit here, which is where master was before. So we had where master was before, we have one offshoot, which is change title two, and another offshoot that's not connected, which was change title one, and then change title one became the next commit for master. So that's what this graph looks like to us right now. And this is one of those places where like, this is why you want to uh, clean up your branches if you can, because if we look at git uh, branch dash A, um, we deleted that pull request after it was merged on GitHub. Oh, yeah. Um, so I will finish up the sentence and then we'll take another 10 minute break. Um, so we did, we did delete this branch off of GitHub. So we want to make sure that all of our branches are roughly in sync with the ones that are at least aren't there on GitHub. So remember, you would need to do git fetch dash dash prune and then git branch dash d um, change title one. It's not like me right now. Okay, get no. And so you can see, like, when I clean up all of those branches, like, there's a lot less noise on this page. Um, and it just helps when you're, like, trying to figure out, like, what is going on with this whole entire repository. Okay, so let's take a 
10 minute break. I will, the timer will come back. And uh, we'll go over the rebracing process right after that. And then I think right after conflicts and rebasing, uh, we're pretty much at the very end, the last section, which is um, explaining the forking workflow. Um, and then we'll pair up and then we can sort of practice it. Uh, so you see it from both ends as a collaborator and as like a contributor. That's what happens when I forget to stop it. Um, okay. Um, so we are just to go back to our diagram. We are currently at this point where we've merged in another pull request and our this other pull request in red uh, now has a merge conflict and how do we go about resolving that I updated the master branch um, such that the pull request that was merged in first is now part of master and now we have to go about incorporating the the other pull request or the other branch um, to fix our merge conflict. And so if we look at the uh, git log with all of the uh, flags and I've created an alias that's just a single, single letter L and it's in the etherpad on, um, if you want this, you can set up your own alias. The, if we read through this graph, um, you can see we are on master, so everything's on master. If we look back in time, there was some merge that happened into master. That was the pull request that we just performed, um, and we can read, compare the commit messages um, to, you know, confirm that on your own if that's what you want. Um, and then if we go back a little bit more, you can see that there is this branch um, that isn't connected to anything. Um, and so one of the question was like, why wasn't there, why wasn't the merge conflict acknowledged before the merge occurs? Um, that's because I think I still have enough history. Um, yes, that's because the other, so if we look at these three lines here, and it's actually nicer that it like inverted the colors from master, you can see um, this branch's history doesn't actually contain this other branch's history, right? Um, so if we think of like a history is where, I, where that the beginning or the latest commit for that branch and all of the previous commits beforehand, it doesn't know that there is an actual conflict. Um, and also you don't want it to prompt that like a conflict is there because what if that was a pull request that you were going to reject anyway? Um, or like it was a pull request that like, um, like wasn't good or is stale or maybe like one was newer and the new one, the newer one fixes the older one. So you're going to ignore or close the other, the older one anyway. Um, so they sort of just treat it. That's sort of, I guess like that's more of a, a, a design decision of why, why like it doesn't prompt you that there's going to be a merge, uh, a conflict until like there's an actual conflict. Um, um, but the, the rationale is like one branch's history actually doesn't see this other branch's history. And so there's no conflict. Okay. Um, so from here, we can see like there was like a diverging uh, part that never got merged in anywhere else, right? And so this is the branch and it's, titled and the branch name is changed title to this is the branch that we're working with i believe when we are i'm trying to see how does the software carpentry they don't talk about this okay so we know that there's going to be a conflict because GitHub told us about it. Fixing a conflict is exactly the same as uh, the software carpentry side where we made a change or we made a change through the same file in the same location. 
um, it's triggering that merge conflict that's a little bit different. Oh, yes, I, this is the set of Blue's Clues. Um, so, like I said before, there's a, there's a lot of different camps of how you want to deal with this merge conflict. One is cherry picking the, the commits itself. So you can imagine cherry picking as I'm on master and I want to, and I know this is the commit I want replayed on top. And so I'm going to cherry pick this commit. In this example, it's one commit. And so it's the differences between the two methods aren't going to be as apparent. The other way, um, I just find it easier in terms of like commands you have to type or things you have to type. But the other way is essentially taking this commits history and changing it such that it also now contains uh, the latest master. And the end goal is going to be the same. It's really just the how Git handles the actual tree is a little bit different. Um, and that's where people like to have not change history and they don't like rebasing or um, they only use chair picking because they don't like rebasing or they find rebasing is just easier because it forces everything to be linear so they like rebasing so that's going to be one of the um, and that's going to vary from like every engineering group from one to another um, so i will show rebasing because it's a little bit i find it conceptually easier um, and that's sort of what we will go through. Um, how does rebasing work? Rebasing, where's my pen? Uh, so if I were to redraw this, um, let's redraw this uh, example. So we have this case right now. And, and I'll recircle this like as black because like that was merged into master. What rebasing is going to do is it's going to go back until it hits the original uh, branch point, go forward to that branch point, and then essentially like move each of those commits one after the other. So you end up in a complete linear uh, state. So you'll see literally on the terminal output, like replaying back commits. The way we, sorry for tapping, the way we do this is we first go to the branch that we're interested in. And then we say like, hey, I want you to update this branch using this other branch, in our case, master as its like base. So the way we do that is we first go to git checkout or git switch. Change title to, and we literally say git rebase, and then the branch that we want to rebase it by off of. Okay, so it's going to say, if there wasn't a conflict, it will just go all the way through, and just like the conflict lesson in GitHub, it it won't show anything, and it'll just say like um, auto merge performing an auto merge and keep going on. In our case, we get this big error message. Um, it's gonna say, fix some conflicts. This is sort of the part where I don't like our studio's um, Git thing because it, it shows you this text, but it forces you to close the window. Um, so like you lose track of like, which are the actual files you need to like go, go in and fix. Um, and so I sort of like looking at this text because I can like at least copy and paste this thing into like Stack Overflow or someone for help. Um, so if we read this, it says resolve all conflicts manually, mark them as resolved. Uh, so it says like if we use git add for the file, that's how we tell it it's resolved. And then we can say git rebase continue to keep going on to the next commit. Um, if there's a commit that we want to skip, we can say skip. And like, if you ever run like rebase or cherry pick and it's like, I have no idea. I tried to fix a conflict, it messed up. You can always abort. And what abort will do is go back to the state before you even ran rebase. So it's like a giant undo button for you. 
and you can see like the the branch name title is also uh, a little it has also changed and you're pretty much in this temporary state because it's very possible that you mess something up and you just want to go back and start over so um so that's what this giant blob uh means and then down here you get like a nice list of like which files you actually need to look look for um yeah so git rebase abort is like your best friend and i believe the same thing happens if you do the cherry pick method you can cherry pick abort um and it will uh, I, I i'll actually show it to you rebase dash dash abort um you you're back to normal essentially like you can see that the thing has changed and if we look at the log like it's it's back to normal so um if if you for example in and this is only one commit, so this is one out of one. Even if you mess something up, like get like like ten out of twelve, or for whatever example, for whatever reason, and you have no idea what's going on, you can always abort the process and start over. So um, don't get too scared if you run uh, rebase. And there's like certain tricks that you can do because I like at least for the carpentry. Um, pull request stuff like the commit messages like each commit message isn't so atomic to the point where like it really matters um, some of the tricks like let's say one of these pull requests has like 25 commits because like one person for every word change wrote like a commit message or something um, this is where you would squash it all into one and then just rebase off of the one commit and that'll just make your life easier um, just having to deal with one commit conflict versus like 25 or something um, so there, there are little tricks that you can do um, like that. And towards the end, I can show you what like squashing on your computer looks like. All right. So we have a conflict. Once we're in this conflict stage, it is like literally go back to the software carpentry, like conflicts um, episode. And it's exactly the same. So what that episode tells us, we open up our readme file. We have these less than equal greater than brackets telling us exactly where the conflicts are and if this is code like be sure to like actually run your code afterwards if this is in the middle of a function sometimes like it's not just as simple like as a, a, like sometimes your function can actually change so if it is code like run the thing from top to bottom again but we literally change these lines to be exactly what we want at the end so let's say, for example, I actually do like the original title, but I also like having the, the, the date in here. Um, so I'll put the date in. I also like the fact that I uh, called it Carpentry Con, not Carpentries at Home. So I will keep that as well. And, and that's, so I, in this example, I sort of combine the conflict into one. So a conflict doesn't always have to be one version or the other, and that's all you can have. Um, you can mix and match, like whatever makes sense as a whole, right? So from that point, um, this is again, back to like, it's chapter, it's like episode nine in the software carpentry Git novice uh, lesson, um, fix our conflict. We can run git status um, and it will tell us no commands are, are you're currently rebasing, fix conflicts and run rebase continue. Uh, you can still skip this and you still have the option to abort. Um, and then it's saying that, well, hey, you made a change to this file. So um, I'm letting you know that this file has changed. So if we go back to before, it says mark them as resolved with git add. So let's do that. We will say git add readme.md. You can run git status because it, it really does help you along if you just run git status after everything and try not to remember commands because I literally don't remember these commands. Literally, I type git status because I actually don't actually remember the next step and I'm relying on uh, its output. So we're still in this rebasing mode. You're currently rebracing. The, all the conflicts are fixed. That's great. And then it's saying like, hey, use this git rebase continue to continue. So I can say git rebase dash dash continue. And here we, because we are rewriting history, um, 
it's going to say like, hey, what, what type of commit message do you want? Um, so we can say, we can keep the original one, that's what's pre-populated for us, and then fix, we can also add and fix conflicts from rebase, just so um, when you see the history, you'll, you'll, you'll know what's going on. But you don't have to add that bit. All right, so we can add save. And now you can see we're back. Like there's no more like weird number for rebasing in our um, branch name. If we go to status, it's gonna say this versus this bit. And if we go to get, look at our uh, log with the pretty branch printouts, you can see that our branch is now on top of master. So mm -hmm. we, um, we literally re replayed our branch on top of master. So now the, the thing is, we still have a reference to the version on GitHub, right? So that's why it says origin change title to versus change title to. The one without origin, so this green one, is the one on our local computer. The one with origin, origin is the name of our remote. So that's why this is now pointing to GitHub. If we want to fix the thing on GitHub, we can go back to uh, our computer here. Oops, oops. I did not know you can just drag the whole section like that. That's cool. Um, so we were fixing everything on our local computer, right? So now we have to deal with um, our remote. And now we use this uh, push pull, right? So um, compartmentalizing like the problems will help you like when you're trying to find the right word uh, for GitHub by a lot. Like up until now, pushing and pulling were not used. It was only used to update master and we fixed all of the merge conflict stuff like without having to pull and push from GitHub again. Okay, so how do we now get the version on GitHub? And this is sort of where uh, people don't like rebasing because you are changing history, right? We've literally, the previous commit from this was this one, but now the previous commit from this is, is that one. And you can see it actually changed because the commit hash has changed, right? And this is why people don't like rebasing is because the commit hash is actually changing. If we were to do just the same thing as before and say git push origin master, sorry, not that, git push, see like the muscle memory, uh, git push origin change title to, this is the, this is the error message like from chapter nine conflicts episode in, in software carpentry. And this is the error message that says, hey, you're trying to push a branch the history of the branch you're trying to push is different from the history of the branch um, on the remote in, in GitHub. It tries to help you run git pull before pushing again. Uh, yes, if that was, if we were only working on master, um, if we didn't do a rebase, that's what we would do. If you were to do git pull origin master, you will essentially turn this back to this version and that rebasing step you pretty much un undid it. But we actually want the version on our computer to be the version on GitHub. So instead of git push, we now have to say dash F for force origin change title two. And this is essentially saying, yes, I know the versions are different. It's because I changed history using rebase. So I want the version on GitHub to also change history please update the version of GitHub to the version I have now. And so that dash F will let you do it. So another reason why I don't like like GUIs is sometimes the dash F is like always there, um, like depending on how they coded the GUI or sometimes it's a checkbox. And again, when you're frantically clicking, you might just click the checkbox when you don't need mean to. So this first failure slows you down in saying that like, hey, you did something weird. Did you mean to do something weird? Yes, I did do a weird thing with the history and I want to force push it. And then, and then it will let you through. And that's, um, that is now back to the same process as before is we pushed a branch to GitHub. Now, if we go on GitHub on branch two, that thing that said that our merge conflict, because we fixed it on our computer, no longer exists on uh, GitHub. And so we can now merge this in. You can also see that GitHub also realized that you did a force push. So you can see there's a force push and 
that's why we needed that dash F. It's because the commit hash changed and the commit hash changed because the history changed. And then this is a pull request that where we fixed a merge conflict from the base master. Um, and so we can just like before merge this just like normal. Um, one of the things in the etherpad, I think Aaron mentioned um, the branch for the carpentry stuff um, will auto delete. Um, but um, if you're working by yourself, please remember to delete your branches when you're done. Otherwise your log, when you look at it is going to be very messy. And some, even for me, like that stash before that wasn't, that didn't need to be there is enough of like, why is there a weird kink in like my tree and I'm trying to trace it down and I don't see it, what's going on. Um, the cleaner that can be like the much better your life will be. And if you accidentally delete it, you'll see that you can always restore it. So um, delete it if you can. And we're back to everything with merging branches, accepting pull requests from before. So we go back to master. We can pull origin master because it's been merged. So now our master branch will need to be updated. We will prune our trees and then look at um, all of our branches and then delete the ones that we don't. And so now we're back to like a nice clean slate. Um, and if another pull request comes in or another branch that we need to do, um, et cetera, et cetera, we're, our version on our local computer is now in sync with the version on GitHub. And so that's essentially collaboration, all the mechanics of collaboration, uh, we just did it with ourselves. So the last half hour to an hour um, is going over is showing uh, what it looks like with another human, with like another person um, that's not yourself. So the mechanics are going to be the same. And on the etherpad, I did give a link to um, one of the Git workflows. Uh, this is a link to the Atlassian page. Uh, this is sort of where I learned, like once I understood like sending a branch and, and accepting your own pull request, a lot of these like Git workflow things that you hear started to make a lot more sense uh, because they're just different uh, conventions of handling branches. So the first thing that they talk about is this centralized workflow uh, right here, which is if you're first starting out, like let's say you just took the software carpentry Git lesson, you're super pumped, you wanna use Git, you want to use it for like yourself and maybe like a couple of other people. That's usually the, where the scaling like ends. Like three is probably too much. The centralized workflow is essentially you go to your repository, you hit settings, you go to, I believe it's under manage access. Yes. You go to manage access and like everybody who is a working on this project, you add as a collaborator and they have like administrative rights or read that the most important thing is they have right access to this repository. And this is what the carpentries gives the maintainers is like you have like read write, I think maybe admin slash owner, I don't remember the details to this repository. And like one of the other uh, questions before is like, why do some people have forking and non-forking? Um, that all happens here. So we as a maintainer have access to this and that means that we can click the green button. Um, we have, which means we can write to this repository. But you can also imagine like, what if like we just had an incoming maintaining maintainers class or um, instructor class, there's 20 people. Uh, they all, for whatever reason, for checkout wanted to work on this one repo. Um, they're not the maintainer. So we can't actually just let them like create anything, ex um, push it in. And then all of a sudden all of our deployments for the lessons are broken, right? So in very small scale, everyone that you're working with, add them as a collaborator. So that is the centralized workflow. You just put everyone who's working on this thing in there um, and it's a free for all essentially. 
one way you can limit the craziness of this workflow. Um, the problem with centralized workflow is everyone's going to be writing to master, the master branch. Um, and that means every time you need to push something, you're going to have to either do a, re, uh, not really do a rebase, but you're going to have to do that pull, update your stuff, repush, pull, update your stuff, repush. Um, so the, and there's no, if you're only working directly on master, there's no enforcement of a code review. So in GitHub, you can go to the branches tab and you can add a branch protect rule which essentially we can put in, for example, master. And we can say like for the master branch, anything that comes into the master branch has to come in as a pull request. That's essentially what is set up for the carpentries. You can enforce a number of reviewers, like maybe only one person, like one maintainer needs to review it. Maybe you need two maintainers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can do, and you can also enforce this for administrators. So like even the, uh, creator can't just write directly to master. Like everything has to come in as a pull request. Everything has to be reviewed by one other person, right? Um, and you can create these branch protection rules. And so that's one way where you can sort of limit the craziness and enforce code reviews. And that's this centralized workflow. The next workflow is this feature branch workflow, right? And so I showed you like, we locked the master branch. Where's the picture for this? Yes, uh, where is the picture for this? Okay, we locked the master branch. Um, essentially, this is everything I just showed you about creating a branch, doing a pull request, merging the branch, except because we locked the master branch, you have to do your work that way, right? No one can just like, oh, it's just like, I forgot a period there, so I'm gonna write directly to master. Like, because master is now locked, um, even adding that period typo requires you to create a new branch, submit it as a pull request, and then merge it in that way. Um, it's a lot more work, but it forces code review, which we, like, the Carpentries materials, it's, it's, the community has grown to the point where, like, yes, this stuff needs to be super stable and reviewed, and uh, we can't just accept anything uh, going in there, right? So that is the feature branch workflow. One step above that, it's really a feature branch. You may have heard something called Git flow. All Git flow is, is some standardized way that people have decided to name their branches. Uh, so the master branch is going to be in line with um, version releases. So like version one dot, uh, version 0 0.1, let me make the text bigger, version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 1.0. And then all of the work in between releases, um, this doesn't pertain too much to the Carpentries material, but you can think of like any, like let's like, I don't know, pandas, for example. Let's say we're planning a 1.2 release next year. Um, and these are all the things we want done before the 1.2 release. And so we will do all of that intermediate work on another branch called develop and develop becomes the branch everyone sends their pull requests into. Um, develop is branched off of master. So you use Git flow when you kind of get a better handle of like how branches work and you make branches off of branches. And when the 1.2 release for whatever is done, you merge that development branch into master, create a new point and you rebranch off again. Um, so Git flow is really just a convention of how people create the branches and it's mainly used for like larger software engineering or software projects. Um, and it, again, it's really just a, a naming convention for branches. Uh, we will do most of our work around the development branch instead of the master branch. And if you're in soft, like more software stuff side, development branch could be automatically like deployed to a development server. The master branch automatically gets deployed to the production server. So you can test things out uh, that way. So that's sort of where the Git flow workflow came in. And it's an extension off of the feature branch workflow. The actual, uh, the model that software carpentry follows is this, this last model called a forking workflow. Um, let's see if there's a picture here. I don't think there's a picture. Okay, there is no picture. 
This is, it's all just text. Okay, we will make a picture. So everything here assumed that um, you can make a push to this remote, right? Like I can say git push origin master, where origin was something I had permission to push to, right? So if I, um, as a carpentry, like let's say for example, I wasn't involved in a carpentries at all. I can still get the lesson code and material off of GitHub. I can clone it down, whatever. But the problem is if I make a change, the pushing command, this version of me going from my computer to uh, that carpentries version on GitHub, that push version is blocked because I am not a contributor. Um, I'm not on that special list. Um, of under managed access. I don't have this collaborator status, so I can't actually do the pushing. So how do I get around that? Um, well, if I made a copy, um, so let me just make a, a new set of diagrams. So let's say we have the carpentries, uh, like, you know, any of the uh, maintainers, right? And then we have uh, Carpentry uh, GitHub, right? So this is the part that we've been working with um, this entire time. This graph actually has four quadrants. For someone who doesn't have um, right access to this, what they can do is they, just like how this download is a clone, and clone is like a thing you do once, there's a one-time thing called a fork, right? And a fork is really just, hey, take your version and copy it into mine, right? So if I go here, um, how do I make a fork? You can literally click fork, um, and this doesn't work for myself. Um, so what does this look like? Um, I will, let me explain this before I actually do it in, in GitHub. You can do a one-time copy call fork. And so now, um, let me draw a stick figure person, right? So now this is my computer and this is now uh, my version on GitHub. I make a one-time copy and now this push-pull, because it's under my account, I'm allowed to do it. Um, so I treat my copy or my fork on GitHub um, as my own personal version. And that lets me to write my branches, write my pushes, write my polls, et cetera, et cetera. If I now want to submit a pull request, I submit it from my fork to the other fork. Um, so the mechanics are exactly the same. Um, once you make the fork, just live in the world down here the world down here is the past three hours of this uh, workshop. Um, and then when we go to create the pull request, it's literally just one drop down menu. And when you create the fork, it's set for you automatically. You create the pull request instead of merging it into your own copy, because um, you want other people, you're trying to contribute back to the project. You send the pull request to the main repository. And so this is where things uh, like remotes become more important uh, because everything is going to be from your perspective, like your machine. And so, so let's say we call this maintainer and we say contributor, right? As a contributor, this version of GitHub can still move forward Yes, so your fork does become a remote and I will go into more of the naming conventions of uh, remotes uh, in a, right after this little bit. So the version on Software Carpentry can still keep moving forward, right? 
And so you need some process to essentially refork. Um, a fork is a one-time process, just like cloning is a one-time process. So you need another way to update your own copy. Like let's say if it's just one contribution, fine, you probably fork, make your change that you need and you're done. But if you're trying to contribute more and you know maybe your goal is to become a maintainer yourself, so maybe one way to do that is work on closing issues and pull requests um, on your own, then you need another way to keep the carpentry version and your fork in sync. And that's why you have one more uh, pull arrow uh, this way. Um, because there is essentially, you need to keep your computer on your local computer because that's where you can actually do work. Um, you need to keep your thing now in sync with two remotes. And this is where this is one of those things where like, okay, this is how large software, open source software projects work. They work on a forking model because it's not possible to add every single possible contributor as a uh, possible like, yeah, contributor as like a collaborator to the project. That is insane. That list on GitHub under settings is gonna be unmanageable, even if you lock branches and stuff. Um, so if you're working like by yourself, working on your like a small lab, like where everyone in the lab on, like can work together, I would highly suggest just add everyone as a collaborator and don't work on the forking model unless you're, unless someone from another university wants to add something, uh, in which case they, that forking model is their responsibility. Yeah, like adding as a collaborator, like these lists, like you can imagine like there's like maybe three maintainers now. And if we forget to pure prune that list, like there's going to be 50 uh, or a hundred or 200. And then what happens like, like if, yeah, I, I, I don't want to know <laughs> how that ended up working. So every open source software project um, follows forking model because it puts the contribution on the person trying to make the contribution. Right. So that kind of makes sense. It makes the maintainers lives a little bit easier. So this is where the naming convention from the two things become a little bit different because now I'm going to be talking strictly from the contributor's point of view. The thing that you have access to, like if you push, if you type in git push origin master or origin whatever, if you can push to that thing by convention, that is the name that you call origin is the origin is the thing you you are allowed to do so before the version that we had on github is called origin because we've been pushing and pulling so essentially i've been setting this whole thing up as this whole forking collaborating thing but we're really still working by ourselves right so we called that origin the repository you got the fork from by convention is called upstream, right? So if you see the words origin and upstream, you are now in, that. that is a clue to me if like, if I'm looking for help or someone's asking me like, if I say like type git remote dash V and tell me what you see. If you see upstream, that's a signal to me that you are following a fork, forking workflow of collaboration. Um, and so the mechanics are going to be the same for everything. The only difference is, let's say you want to make another pull request. Instead of pulling from origin. Yeah, and I was gonna ask you just one more time to repeat the definitions for origin and upstream. Oh, okay, cool. So origin by convention is the remote repository you, like you yourself, have push access to like you can push and you are allowed to do it um, upstream by convention is the repository or the remote repository um, that you forked from Thanks. so yeah so how does this work like let's say um, so let's kind of like backtrack 
and let's say we instead of creating a repository from scratch um, we want to work on um, a software carpentry lesson because we're not a collaborator yet we will fork that lesson so I'll use the novice git lesson as an example we'll fork the novice git lesson to our version so the URL will literally be instead of carpentry slash git novice will be like my like my GitHub username git novice. So that's my copy. I can do whatever I want with my copy. Uh, the maintainers don't care what I do with my copy. They only care if I want to create this pull request. And this pull request, just like uh, the first three hours, is pushing a branch, and GitHub handles the pull request in that like oh, GitHub will know this is a fork when you submit a pull request you probably mean to the original repository. So GitHub does a few things for you automatically. So that works out for the first pull request. If we want to keep updating, we have to sync our version with the GitHub version. So the difference is the difference here in the forking workflow and why it's a layer of complexity for the contributor is now you have to know when you pull code, you pull code from upstream and you push your code to origin uh, to submit the pull request. And that's how you keep these three compartments in sync. Uh, because if you in this pull request um, section, if there's like a merge conflict with the branch, if there's something you need to do, you need to get the information from the original upstream repository first. Um, and so uh, that's where all of these pulling from upstream, pushing to origin, but if you're still working on your own local branch and you're trying to sync up work, you're still pulling from origin as well. So that's where like drawing this picture out uh, becomes very important uh, because it tells you like, what is the thing you're trying to sync? Are you only, do you only care about the thing that's on your copy? Then you can push pull to it. If you're trying to get information from upstream so you can update your own stuff, you need to pull from upstream before you push to yours. So these three things are in sync. So what does this all look like in uh, practice? Um, so this is where like the, the um, okay. So uh, here's a brand new GitHub account. Um, what does this look like? I literally put a two at the other end. So what does forking look like? Um, you would, take. So I think the way I'm going to do it is the right hand side is going to be the collaborator and the left hand side is going to be the uh, maintainer. So on the right hand side, uh, we will go to the repository that we're interested in. Uh, so this uh, one that we've been working on. Um, and then we literally find on the top, there is a, there we go. There's a button called for. Okay, so we will, <laughs> I will probably walk, walk someone through. So who can like share their screen right now? <laughs> or? I can do it. So okay. Drake speaking. Okay, Drake. Uh, are you allowed to share your screen? I guess that's, that's the next question. <laughs> uh, do you have the green sharing screen button on the bottom. I, I'm blocked because the host is the only one that's available to share. Uh-huh. Angela, are you there right now? Angela might have stepped out. I'm going to see if I can find... Angela, Angela says it should be allowed now. She's not speaking, but she mentioned in the chat. Thanks. Try again. Oh, okay. Uh, so let me stop my share, and hopefully you can share yours. Cool. Uh, and it's still recording. Great. So... What does this look like from, so let's say you are going to be a collaborator for me, right? So you will go into GitHub, go to uh, like look up my username, which is, uh, I'll put it in chat, uh, which is Chen Daniel Y. Uh, so for the carpentries and it would literally be like one of the carpentry lessons. Uh, so on the, the, I wanna say like the easiest way might be like on the URL bar, Go to github.com slash, yeah, and then my username. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all of GitHub. Correct. Um, 
it doesn't just click any one so you can just get to my page and then click on my name yeah and then go to repositories and it'll it'll be sorted for this one at the very top so you click that great um then you click the fork button and you will fork it to your your name um, so you're part of other organizations you can literally copy it into another organization and so that was if you go back to that diagram like that four quadrant the bottom left process where we took the uh original uh, carpentry repo or mine and made a, cop a fork into mine. And you, you'll see at the top left corner, it literally says your name slash the same name. And then underneath it says forked from um, the original location, right? So now this is actually your copy, right? It literally has your name in it. So how do we get this on your computer? Um, you click on code and just like the first thing we did this morning where we copied it into our computer, you click that um, SSH URL, yes. And then in your terminal, um, so this is also why like I have the Git folder. So like I can always CD to the Git folder and clone in there because you don't want to, again, nest Git repositories. So um, wherever you are good, you will Git clone and paste that in. And now you have exactly my version, except it's a copy of yours, a copy of mine on your GitHub that exists on your computer, right? So you can now CD into that um, repository. And from this perspective, um, yeah, it's like 2020, and I think you can hit tab. From this perspective, um, forget about the whole forking workflow. Like this is now you working by yourself, right? The original uh, maintaining, original repository has no idea you made a fork. Um, so now if you look at git remote-v, um, because of that forking model, it sets this up for you automatically, right? So wherever you cloned from, GitHub will auto, like Git will automatically set that location as the origin. So it's also very important that you, when you clone to your computer, you clone the version on your fork, not the original one, because otherwise the default naming is going to get messed up. When you do a fork, you now also need a reference to the other repository, right? So right now we only have reference to origin, like where does upstream come from? Um, so upstream, if you go back to GitHub and you click on the, the button, the link bef below that says forked from Daniel Chen, like the top left. Yeah, so if you click that one, you get the URL from that copy. So you click on code and you click copy or uh, I think you can use SSH. Yeah, because it you're not you're not going to be pushing to it anyway, but it just saves you from typing your password. So you get the SSH URL there, and now you type git remote add upstream and then paste. So this is from the software carp the first um, git software carpentry git lesson, except now instead of you putting in origin. Uh, you're putting in upstream. So now if you look at git remote-v, you have the reference to both locations. And that's why by habit, when I type in git fetch, I put in dash dash all because it'll fetch everything. So now if you do git fetch dash dash all, for example, it'll get, get all of the references from all of your repositories. So you see it's fetching from origin, fetching from upstream. And now if you type in that very long git log, uh, git log dash dash one line dash dash graph decorate all. Um, this is also why like cleaning up your branches become really important because now you have all of the references from upstream along with all the references from origin. Um, and you'll see it uh, when you hit enter where head is pointing to master. You have a reference to origin master and you have a reference to upstream master. Right. So all of the references are there. Um, but now um, we can, because we have the reference to the um, original project, we don't have to worry about um, that stuff anymore, right? So remember, like, draw the picture and then just think about what are you most concerned with right now? It, I'm only concerned with my local copy. So just like, so we can do something very simple, like, let's make a branch. So you can say git checkout dash b. And then um, I guess you can put your name in there <laughs> as like your branch name. And hit enter, and then uh, so now you're also in that branch. Um, you can 
edit the readme file um, at the bottom. Uh, it's read, yeah, you forgot to hit tab. <laughs> Um, I, I guess you can put in like your name at the bottom or something. Uh, like hello from, <laughs> or please accept me. <laughs> yeah, so this part is exactly the same from before, right? So you will um, add, commit, push your branch, right? So these mechanics are exactly the same from like all this entire workshop. Um, we added another layer, that forking layer, but other than clicking fork and setting up the remote, um, we can, that's all like, we don't have to worry about that because all of our work um, is still just working on our own uh, repository. Oh yeah, you might have to zoom in a little bit, but um, cool. Um, so if you go to the GitHub page now, you'll notice that it all actually like already, like GitHub automatically realized something was like going on. If you, I think if you hit back on the browser, you'll see like even in your copy, um, it should have prompted something. Maybe it hasn't. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you can click, uh, click on branches. Yeah, so you are Right, so you see on the uh, the drop down, it says like the base repository is mine and my base is master. And it says um, head repository is Drake, compare master. You switch that toggle to your branch. And so this is the same thing if you were working on your own, you can switch different branches merging into different things. So this view is going to be exactly the same as before you're creating a pull request. The only difference is that left hand side where instead of your own project, you're merging it into someone else's project. And so you will hit create pull request. And you can hit create pull request there. Um, cool. So um, if you unshare your screen, I can show you what life looks like on my end. So as a maintainer, uh, I have my pull request screen. So Essentially, like, remember when I said like cl collaborating with other people is just like collaborating with yourself, except you don't know who the other yourself is. Um, this view is exactly the same as a collaborator or contrib uh, the maintainer. I got this pull request. I can click it. Uh, the way it's set up, it's forcing a review. So I can like approve this review, um, et cetera. And I get this green button, right? So there's like that extra step because it's not the owner and I can also prevent the owner from accepting uh, their own stuff. And so I can look at files change. He wrote, hello from Drake, fine. Um, we can have a conversation, et cetera. At the end of the day, I can hit merge pull request and it's merged. And if it's a one-time contribution, like most, like maybe like instructor checkout only, um, that's all they need to do and you've accepted or, or closed their request. Um, so from Drake's, uh, so from Drake's point of view, um, how does he get that, new, like the original repository has now changed, right? How does he, can you share your screen one more time so I can, so what does this look like from his point of view? Um, I can close the branch if I want. If you now go to, uh, your version of GitHub. Um, yeah, your copy, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's probably the easiest way. Your copy, your copy at the bottom does not have that line that you just added, right? So you now you need to work on this whole, this three-way synchronization um, problem. The way you do that, uh, you could theoretically delete this and refork it, but we're not doing that. Uh, you go back to your terminal and then you say git pull upstream master because you're trying to get the new update from the upstream location. Oh, sorry, you have to go to master first. So we will check out to master. We will pull, instead of origin master, we're going to pull from upstream master. We, we're allowed to do that because it's on GitHub. We should be able to get code, we just can't push. So if there's a merge conflict or whatever, that will happen here potentially. 
And then to finish off the synchronization, you can say git push origin master. Uh, and this is also why if you, if you, especially if you work on the forking workflow of collaboration, like I don't like the defaults because now what is upstream and what is origin, like these things actually do matter now. Um, so now if you go back to your copy, uh, your copy is now in sync. And so that means um, if you, uh, wait, what happened? Uh, wait a minute. Updated two minutes ago. Uh, wait, can you can you click on that again? That should have went through. Wait, did you type the right thing? Oh, you typed the wrong thing. Wait, no. Uh, no, no, that's right. Uh, can you refresh the page? <laughs> it's supposed to work. I I promise. <laughs> Please be there. Five minutes ago. Was it five minutes ago? It seems like it was. Uh, uh, oh no. Uh. Well, that's weird. That's definitely not supposed to happen. Uh. Did you, can you click on your terminal again? You did it, get checkout master, get pull upstream master, something, something. Fast forward, get push origin master. That's weird. Uh, Okay, I need to fix, figure out what, what is going on. Uh -oh. oh, something went wrong with the merging. That's what happened. What happened? Um, jump to what happened. Daniel Master from. Okay, I need to figure out what that part is. Uh, but his version is supposed to be updated. Um, I'll probably write up um, after the, the class, like what, what exactly went wrong. Uh, it's probably something, something weird that didn't get typed, but that, that is the, um, so if you unshare your screen again, um, so I can share the diagram. Uh, that is the general process of you do work on your own. And that's like, the three close to four hours that we have. And then you pull uh, from, you submit the pull request and any new changes you pull from upstream and then you can restart the cycle over it again. And as the maintainer, that's why you try to um, have people fix their own stuff before accepting it. Uh, but uh, that is most of the mechanics of, of what you need to know as a maintainer. The, the only uh, thing I, I guess I haven't uh, covered is like fixing someone else's pull request. And the way you could do that is when you look at uh, the log, um, you will see that uh, branch in here. It might not be a branch on your local computer, but you will literally say, um, copy this version, check it out and create that branch with the same name on your local computer and you can push to that same pull request. Um, that's roughly how you would fix your own. So um, yes, as in, I guess since we have like 10, 10 minutes left, I guess I'll just open it up to questions. If anyone has any questions, there's only like a few, like a uh, few people here. So if anyone has questions, uh, you can, ask them and I can try to show you uh, what it looks like um, on my end. Dan, uh, I have a question, I think. Um, I've never actually set the upstream. when. So when I clone a fork, when I, when I fork a Carpentries repo and then I clone it, down to my um, local computer. I've never actually manually set the upstream. Um, 
my workflow maybe has an extra step in it then because I make changes locally and then I push to my fork and then I put in a pull request on the GitHub uh, interface. Is mm -hmm. that, what is the downside to doing it that way? And is there, so, are there pickups I'm gonna see? Yeah, so essentially you don't have like this diagonal link, right? That's essentially what right, right. Um, So the only downside is, um, if you need to fix a merge conflict, um, essentially the problem is you have no way to keep at, like up to date with what's going on on the carpentry side. So you can create pull requests and if like most of our lessons, they're not like changing drastically and you might be making correction from one lesson and then a totally separate uh, episode, in which case you can keep submitting these pull requests because like the file itself has no conflicts or if there is a con if it's the same file it's in a different location um, and if and if you're the only person making these changes then essentially these two things are going to be in sync because no one else is doing work onto here the the issue ends up being um, what if 10 people submitted for example like what if 10 people submitted a pull request and they all got merged in that and those 10 things were not anything you worked on um, but you need to fix one of those things, right? Like, let's say I added my name somewhere where my name shouldn't have been and, and you want to fix it. Because you don't have that version on anything you're allowed to work on, then you can't fix it. It literally doesn't exist on your end to fix. And so you need this link so you can pull, get everything from the carpentry side that's up. So essentially, essentially it's updating everything so that your stuff matches the carpentry stuff, and then you okay. can make your connect, uh, make your corrections from there. So okay, that's yeah, really that's the right. only downside. So um, I do, I, I, I guess I have a workaround for that, which is I do on on the GitHub interface. I do a pull request from the official repo to my fork, and then I accept that before, um, before I do. Yeah. 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 So yeah. okay, so this is a more smooth way to do it that makes sense. yeah so the this is like the like what if i need to actually like go into the middle of the woods uh and do work and i need a copy of the carpentry stuff up to date as is you know um something like that um it, it's it's really like if you draw out this diagram it's really like you only need this arrow if you need everything up to here like up to date it's really just an update way because that's the only way you can update it the, the other way is literally delete your copy on github and refork it <laughs> to get everything as up to date as you can but uh, that's what this diagonal arrow for the pull is and it's only one way because chances are you don't have the the other arrow that lets you push you don't have the permissions to do that um, if you did you probably wouldn't have to do this extra layer forking uh, so that's just an extra uh, thing uh, so Drake had a question um, so I just wanted to confirm with you that the reason that we don't see that line is because of the R markdown syntax. We didn't put an extra white space to go to new line. Oh, so, we didn't. So <laughs> it's on, it's it's there. It's all updated and it's all working the way that it was supposed to work. Oh, it is there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is there. Okay. Okay, there we go. I should have caught that actually. So that's like a bad maintainer. <laughs> there you go. Maintainers can mess up. Oh yeah, it totally is there. All right. So, um, so it wasn't a total screw up. Okay, cool. That worked. I'm glad that worked because I would have been like, what happened? That's <laughs> yeah, in my local repo too, like in the version that I plugged over. So everything worked through it's supposed to. Okay, yeah. So I, I guess like in the screen share it, it does show up like this is Drake's repo at the bottom. He does have his thing, his name there. Um, but yeah. Great. On that note, um, I think we're going to conclude for today. I want to paste a link to a feedback survey um, that they want us to fill out um, for carpentry con sessions. So if you have a few minutes, we'd really appreciate if you could fill that out. Um, give a big round of applause to Dan for leading us through so much Git. I think I learned just so much. Like I, I feel like I've I've had a little bit of exposure, but um, definitely got a few tips today that are are going to be so helpful for me going forward. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Oh, one more thing before the recording. Um, so um, I guess one other link, uh, I have to find it. I think it was August when I wrote the blog post. Uh, where was it? Uh, oh, okay. Um, so I'll put it in chat and in the etherpad so I don't forget it. But there was this uh, blog post that I put in 
uh, as the uh, round of maintainers came in. And it's, it's essentially what I was talking about of like how you can edit someone else's pull request. Um, so yes, it's not like in this workshop, but like it's written, at least this part is written somewhere on the internet that you can follow with like pictures and commands and stuff. Uh, but all of the uh, mechanics um, are all the same. It's, it's literally trying to get like the right branch um, to, to work on. So the mechanics are all the same. It's, 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 yeah, it's just weird because you're trying to fix someone else's work. Great. Okay. Um, all the notes for the session um, have been taken in the etherpad that was for the session. So we did ask to record everything. Um, thank you, Aaron, also for taking this in the second half of the day. Um, I think with that, uh, we're pretty much done. I want to use a pause sign to thank mm -hmm. Dan and I want to stop recording. So thank you so much. And looking forward to, we have another session that is the exact same on August 5th. So if you're interested in um, attending on August 5th and catching the um, same version of this. If you wanted to review something specific, um, feel free to tune in then and it should be yeah. the same. The August 5th, 5th one is four hours earlier because I was supposed to like make it more European friendly. Uh, that was sort of why I did it, so. Thank you, Dan. So, yeah. This was amazing. I'm really glad that I stuck through it. I almost <laughs> had to sign off because my brain was like full, but um, you. thank you for all the breaks. Yeah. All right. Um, and if you have questions, yeah, like just message me on the Carpentry Slack.